So for the environmental stress screening, this is my favorite slide. That looks like chamber blue to me. Caution, this machine has no brain. Use your own. A lot of people used to do, <coughs> excuse me, what was called cookbook testing. And what that was, okay, think about if you're going to bake something. Okay, it used to be TV dinners you baked in the oven. You remember that? Mm -hmm. Okay, you turn the oven on to preheat it. When it's ready, you open the door. Yeah, put your item in. Maybe you're told to fold back the aluminum on one corner. You leave it there as long as the directions told you to. When it's done, you open the door, you pull it back out, you put it on a safe surface. If it's still cold in the house, you leave the door open, but you turn the oven off. Okay, that's cookbook. You're told exactly how to do it. You just follow the steps and you never have to think. Do you think the testers like that? There's no blame if you do exactly follow the directions and everything is spelled out. Except not all test procedures spell it out correctly. Okay? But people liked it that nobody could blame them. You know? I, I didn't choose those limits, it was right there. And they don't worry about tailoring that way. They also weren't catching failures that were getting out into the field. So the idea is to use your brain. This is where the tailoring comes in. And maybe if the contract says you have to follow the procedure exactly, maybe you can actually talk to the person that's giving you that procedure and say, you know, this really doesn't quite make sense. Would you consider raising it to this temperature or raising it to the, this vibration level because those are measured from real world. I've got real world, world data to back that up. And so you might get a change. If you don't, you might still end up just using a cookbook. So we want to disclose the, pro the product defects. Systematically improve the product manufacturing. This is because there can be an iteration. And then demonstrate pro production consistency, which is a variability reduction. Now, when you worked in, in quality, did you have to look for variability? Uh, not that I remember. Okay, did, so did variability, you? Variability. Not that I remember. We had specs that everything had to follow. I'm not sure I understand. Okay, that could be something like even in a, a pop factory, you know, a bottling factory. 99% of the caps all get twisted on properly, but one is crooked. Your variability would, would be the fact that it w was crooked, but that happened once every 1,000 maybe. Okay, and so you, you would figure out from that variability. A lot of times it's the quality people that have okay. to do that. No. Um, in, in one of our products, there was only two products being built, but they were really complex uh, satellites. And so there was not really a variability concern. It had to be right, right then, and if the part was wrong, go back, rebuild it, re, re uh, manufacture it. Um, and then in the other uh, satellite program, yeah, I think variability in, in the GBD program would have been somewhat of a concern. You know, 25 of those satellites were for the GPS satellites. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, I mean, if you've got a production line and it's running, you tend to take a sample every so often. You just grab one off the line and you check it out. You know, and sometimes they'll put like an X on the label, it's okay. Um, and then in, in some cases, it, it, they go ahead and, and ship that sample. In other cases, they don't. Depends on how expensive it is. In, a, in the weapons program, we do these neutron generators, which are the triggers for, for weapons. And those we do, they pull four out of a lot of 20. That's more of a production. And we still don't have a, much of a variability reduction there. They're all very consistent, so I've never come across like a variability factor. Where I've seen the most is, especially in, in very low and cheap plastic production. Okay, like for little kids' toys that go in McDonald's 
happy kits or whatever they are. <laughs> it, just the, the, or else, um, I've had it with, with little cars when I was a kid, and you could pick them up for like a quarter, and the plastic would actually have like a little extra, and so I'd have my grandpa cut it off um, so that it, it was smoother. That would be a variability because there was an issue with the production. Now, if it was something that could actually become critical, then you would worry about it. If one out of every hundred camera lenses that you got was scratched on the inside, you would need to find out what in production was doing that because it should have been caught before it, it ever um, got into the process. We were, it's funny, I was just on a call last night after I left with one of our potential lens manufacturers. We've got like three that we're, you know, that we're um, looking at. And like, we have such strict requirements on, you know, certain dimensions on these on, of these lenses that they were telling us that they're only getting like a 76% yield. Of the lenses that they make, 76% of them meet our specs. <laughs> so there's like, you Well, know, then you know they're checking. I mean, that, yeah, that's Yeah, oh, no, yeah. Well, I mean, this early in the process they are because yeah. we're still at, you know, they're, they're still, um, you know, um, they're not guaranteed you know, that they're going to get the contract, but they're still competing, so they're being very strict about it, but I was just like, wow. So that means you're throwing away a quarter of the things that you make, or maybe they, well, you know, they remanufacture them. them. Else. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, they might remount the glass, you, you don't know, and, and reform it, but um, they know they have a variability, now it becomes a business de decision, do they want to reduce that variability? Okay, it's going to save them a lot of money if they do. Mm -hmm. If they don't have to throw away a quarter of the things that they make, yeah, you'd think that would save yeah. some money. <laughs> so that, that was a great example. Now, ESS helps in all of these processes. So what actually is it? Now, this is the definition. A process, okay? <laughs> ESS, a lot of people say, I'm going to do an ESS test. It's actually a process. Now, there's no ESS police that are going to come and cuff you for saying test. But it is a process which subjects devices to physical or climatic stress. So physical would be more like vibration. Or combinations thereof, so you can do them singly, on an accelerated basis, but within product design capability. That means that you should know in advance what that design capability is. And you should have learned that in the design process. This applied stress forces flaws, which would normally be latent or incipient failures. This would be either they're hidden or they're intermittent. <clears throat> to force those into observable failures. If the flaws were left undetected, they might cause unpredictable product failure at a later time. Right? So you want to try to find the hidden problems. So it is not considered such mainly because it's so long. Okay, even though it, it's 10 days, the average ESS test might only take take a few hours. But you've had, but you've had the most extreme environments here. Yes, and again, that's it's going to be contractual. If your contract says that's part of ESS, then it's part of ESS. Okay, I've seen people do the oddest tests and say this is ESS and I just, I try very hard to keep a straight face because I would never label it that way. But in their contract it is. So they, they have the right to call it that if they want to. What well, ESS is not, it is not actually a hardware test even though hardware is getting a test at the time, but it is a test of the production process. Is this being manufactured correctly? So some of the difference, there are failures. In ESS, a failure is actually desirable because then you can find out what's actually going wrong. It's planned for. If you're just doing a hardware test, like the ones we were talking about for the last two days, it's undesirable to find a failure. It's planned that it will not occur. The criteria for ESS is process control. That's what we're trying to do is, to, is make sure that the manufacturing process is under control. Hardware test, it's accept, reject, or how most people call it, it's just pass-fail. This is a pass-fail test. Okay, they have their criteria, and that's all they're going to hit. There are little check boxes. It either passes or it fails. The objective of ESS is to actually stimulate the failure. 
okay, to get that environment to the flaw site so that you can find out what's going on. In hardware, it's more to simulate the design or performance conditions. The parameters with ESS, the way it's put is set by economics. Okay, it may actually change. You don't want to test it to the point that it's totally unrealistic to be able to have the process do it. 76% is not good enough for most companies. But when you get down to 0.01%, maybe it's just not worth it to try to make it better. Okay, Financially, it may not be worth it. Um, with the hardware test, it, it's it's got very rigid parameters. You're just following, you will do this. Before ESS started, it was basically burn-in. Burn-in has gone out of favor, thankfully, because it's not very good for a lot of things. Basically, you raise the temperature. You had what they even called them ovens, okay? You put your stuff in the oven. You raise the temperature. You power the things on. Sometimes power cycling, a lot of times it was just on at all times. You keep it there for X amount of hours and you take it out. The scariest burn-in I ever saw was with a company that manufactured pacemakers. Their burn-in room, and it, it, you don't have to have a chamber, you can use a room. Their burn-in room was kept at 98.6 degrees and the pacemakers were left there for 30 days. And I looked at them and I said, what if somebody runs a fever? It didn't matter to them. That was their test. They weren't going to extremes. Now, how extreme is it that a person might have a 101 fever? That's not Pretty unusual. Common. Um, once a year, right? Yeah. Um, my aunt recently stayed out in the sun too long, got sunstroke. When they took her to the hospital, she had a 107 degree body temperature. Okay, if she had a pacemaker, would it be okay if it quit? You know, now that is extreme, and, and a lot of people wouldn't have lived through it for it being that temperature for over an hour. But you have to have some leeway in there. Okay, so if you pick a burn-in number, make sure that it's actually providing a stress. Now, what they're, they're doing nowadays, capacitors tend to be the things that still need the burn-in process because they will get hot during usage. Okay, there are other things when they are naturally hot during usage, it might go through that, but burn-in has lost favor because it's not really doing anything. You're just keeping it at a single temperature. Things, remember we talked about, they become conditioned. They get used to that temperature. Okay, cycling tends to bring out stresses more quickly. A slow process, because it just sits there like the pacemakers for a whole month, they sit there. It finds a very low number of infancy failures. Now, are you familiar with the bathtub curve? Mm -hmm. Okay, so most of the failures are found right in the beginning, and then it tends to level out. Okay, now people have started to disprove that, and it's actually more spiky. It's not as much of a bathtub. But we're talking about the failures that you would normally find right away. Those are the ones we want to cut that curve off so that these aren't going to the customer. Does that make sense? Another precursor, now they were trying to improve things. It's called the portable appliance testing. I've actually seen this more in the UK than in the US. But this would be like household appliances. Um, there would be a preliminary inspection. You would make sure there's earth continuity tests. Have you ever seen a, a sticker like that? You'll find it on the back of toasters, coffee pots, and things. They need to make sure they're properly grounded. There may be insulation testing and then put it through a functional test. I got such a kick out of this statement. Okay, This is an actual quote I found. Such work should, be, should only be carried out by a competent person. Okay, it, it just hit me as funny because all testers, <laughs> hopefully, would be chosen as competent persons. And this is actually a subset of the environmental testing. Okay, but they weren't really using much of a forcing function. They're just saying, okay, it would be like having a Mr. Coffee and turning it on and making sure that it worked. Waiting for the, the timer to turn it back off. A lot of office fires have actually been started by Mr. Coffee's. I'm very happy that they have built in timers in into coffee makers so they, they automatically turn off after an hour or two.